Dr. Kiltz, thank you so much for being here. I'm just happy to be with you and your, your smile is one of the best. You're such a bright light. Um, we've had a couple of conversations, but I still have a lot to learn about you. So thank you for taking the time to be here today. And um, I just wanna start out by asking, how did you, how did you get interested in learning about your nutrition? I mean, you are one of the top carnivore, I think, examples and leaders right now, especially with the high fat and um, just against the grain of traditional medicine and nutrition recommendations. So how did you get to be where you're at now? Accidental. You know, you trip over things in life. And um, let's see, born and raised in L.A., uh, undergrad was in biology. I was a art major. I did pottery and painting and things like that, but I, I didn't make any money at it. Never thought I would. Um, and, and, um, I actually, an undergrad at university of Southern California, I was in uh, nutritional biochemistry and wow. I did research in that area, but you know, I wasn't, it never dawned on me that this is where I would be going. I just was working to get into medical school and uh, going to medicine to be a doctor. My sister suffered from diabetes for years. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, you know, this is, I saw her suffering and uh, it was something I was interested in figuring, you know, how to help people. Well, as a standard doctor, I learned how to uh, diagnose disease and prescribe treatments. And the treatments were usually within a surgical procedure or a medication. Um, and that was sort of really it. The, the rules, could I say that we ever learned a diet? Uh, no, we didn't really ever learn a diet because our diets what were whatever our culture, social, mm -hmm. cultural norms were. Um, Italian upbringing, Mediterranean diet, but my my uh, I grew up around Mexican food and Chinese food and all sorts of different uh, uh, cultural food sources, and no one ever said, "Well, this is the cause of disease." And right. and even diabetes, it was well, it was just unlucky. And that was it for my sister who, who died at 52 from it. Um, oh, wow. I'm sorry. No, thank you. Thank you. No, she was a, she's a, still a light in my, in my life, you know? So uh, my good friend, Dave Kilmer uh, died of uh, cancer at age 52. He was a medical doctor, amazing, amazing inspiration for me. He was healthy when he died. And, and so about 20 years ago, I started integrating in my medical fertility practice, mindfulness and meditation and prayer, yoga and acupuncture, because one of the things I, I learned about fertility is many people didn't show up or they dropped out because it was too emotionally difficult. So I thought, well, what are the things that we can do to, to brighten the mind and help us stay on course? Because it's the doing that ultimately is the getting of anything, right? Where, yeah. where many people just don't show up or they give up. And, and again, I was, I, I went into OBGYN and went into fertility um, because uh, I just love those areas and uh, very um, healing and helping uh, delivering a baby and is such an amazing thing. And then helping people who can't get pregnant was also another amazing thing. And I went into the surgical field and the field of in vitro fertilization. And uh, some of my patients that were doing the mindfulness, the yoga, the acupuncture, uh, suddenly we're getting pregnant on this diet called paleo diet. And this was about 20 oh. years ago. I said, okay. well, what's paleo diet? I had no idea. Now I was a crazy exerciser and I, you know, I, I cared. I wanted to have a good physique and little ego and things like that. And that's why I, I ran or biked. I swam. I did everything. I did Weight Watchers. I did Atkins. You know, I was, every time you wanted to cut down and get to that, like that muscular weight, you had to do something extra. And that's where Weight Watchers or Atkins came in. Uh, but I suffered, by the way, let me just add this in. I suffered as a child with migraines, uh, mm. bowel problems, dyslexia. I couldn't read, ADHD, many other diseases. And over time, I developed arthritis, psoriasis, kidney stones, migraines, and more bowel bleeding. And um, as I was learning more about paleo diets, I started reading because if there's something that can help my patients get pregnant, I wanted to know about it. Then if it was, if it was uh, integrating Eastern and Western medicine, great. If it was strictly Eastern or strictly Western, whatever it was, I was in on it. So I learned about paleo diets and then I found tripped over keto diets. And I actually met Marie Emmerich 
uh, long ago over keto diets. And, and, uh, and, and from there, um, I got better myself personally, and I would have some people getting pregnant on paleo and keto diets. And I talk about those things and carnivore was just, you know, I just never really talked about it, but about 12 years ago, I, I, uh, listened to someone on some video on, 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 um, on the internet and he was a carnivore and he didn't exercise and he looked ripped and he only ate fatty meat. I said, this is for me. And then I, I quickly in like one month, my bowel bleeding, arthritis, hemorrhoids, kidney stones, migraines, all gone. Wow. And I'm like, all right, this is amazing. Now I pretty much have shared mostly paleo keto and fasting for years, but over, over COVID, I kind of came out to that carnivore is really my master class. And I started writing more and publishing more and talking more about it until I believe I now really understand the human body in a way that I, I don't think we're taught in medical school or science okay. at, at all. And it's a game changer that everyone has the right to understand and learn. Mm. Wow. Wow, that's so powerful. I had no idea that was 12 years ago. So have you been pretty much straight carnivore since then? I am not a strict carnivore. Oh, okay. So what does a day uh, of eating look like for you? Let's delve into that. Well, well, look at um I'm a human being that lives in life that drives a car, flies airplanes, um, uh, skis and snowboards, and does things that are deadly and dangerous. Um, the majority of the things I do, I work on safety and carefulness. And the same thing I do with my eating. The majority yeah. of what I eat is ribeye steak every day. Uh, Snake River Farms is my go-to steak. I buy the either the black or the gold uh, ribeye bone in, and I buy mm. five or 10 at a time in the freezer. I will dry age them in my refrigerator for a week or two, cut them up, either eat them raw or black and blue. And I typically cool. eat at night. I don't eat breakfast or lunch. I okay. rarely snack. And, um, but, but time to time, maybe every couple of weeks, I'll have some French fries fried in duck grease dipped in sour cream with my buddies when we have a guy's night out. Um, but, uh, and, and I'll make my ice cream, which is, which is full fat cream. I get the very best. I, I work to get it without any additives awesome. and, um, eggs and, um, and a little bit of vanilla bean and a little bit of white cane sugar. Because in wow. truth, a little bit of sugar is not the or the harm. Right. It's excessive consumption of plants and lean meat that is the deadly killer. So Amen. I like to I like to kind of show off my my baby's diet. Well, it's called the baby's way. It's it's bacon, eggs, butter, beef, kilts, ice cream, and salt. I need that. And it's got the ice cream recipe in it. You just awesome. everything I have, by the way, is online for free. Pretty much, you yeah. can go online to drkilts.com and download all of this stuff. And I share it and talk about it. We just put out our new Kilts is Keto is Carnivore, which should come out on Amazon soon. And then I got my my keto guide and also my fertility guide. And I've got some other books on on faith and daily intentions and inspiration, mm. which. You know, again, I put them out there because I need this stuff personally, right? right. I suffered, but I also healed from it. But it's yeah. not something that you do from time to time. You have to have a daily habit. That is what I think is is most important. I totally agree. The consistency is key. And that's what changed my life. I was always bouncing around one extreme to the next, you know, Whole30, AIP, paleo. I did keto. And I finally healed doing carnivore in a way that was sustainable for me. I couldn't do just beef, salt, and water. I needed lamb. I needed goat. I needed variety. And for me to just keep my head low and be consistent, I reversed so many things in just one year. So I'm, I love that you, you practice what you preach. And yes, just want to share with who's watching. You put out so much free content. I see you on Instagram live almost every day. You answer questions. Your Instagram is full of inspiration. I mean, I go there. I'm not a fan of scrolling <clears throat> scrolling or sitting on my phone, but I go to your Instagram just to be inspired on a regular basis. Um, and I think that only comes from 
someone who has been changed and who has a message of hope to share. You have a true conviction that, hey, I was sick. This helped me. I'm in the same boat as you. It's kind of like you can't keep this secret to yourself. That's amazing. No, yeah, so my suffering led to understanding spirituality and faith in God. And then my, my physical and emotional uh, suffering also guided me to understanding the, the healing power of food. Georgia Eid is an amazing one that I've been listening to for a long time. Andres Ienfeld. I mean, I kind of started off in the paleo world, keto world, but remember paleo and keto are made up. Right. There are only, there are only three diets. That's it's either an herbivore, an omnivore, or a carnivore. And, mm. and that's really it. And, you know, are we strict? I, you know, again, there are some people that are all power to them, but, but as a human being that goes to parties occasionally and, and celebrates uh, life, I will occasionally eat a cookie cake or ice cream. Um, I will occasionally have French fries, but I won't touch salad anymore because it's nature's toilet paper. <laughs> but my favorite was a Caesar salad. Oh, I love it. I love Caesar salad, but I love these things, but I know that if I have them, sometimes I get sick. And yeah. so I, I've really found that if I stick to my fatty meat and again, you can do pork, you can do lamb, you can do goat, you can do bison, elk, you can do chickens and ducks and all those sort of things. But my bet is we evolved eating fatty red meat. Right. And, and that is probably the healthiest. Now, I, and I know that fatty meat has the most fat in it because chicken, the, the muscle doesn't have any fat, it, you right. know, the fat somewhere else. And maybe even duck and many of these other animals, but fat is the fuel for the Ferrari. We are, we are not driven by sugar. And that's one thing people have to realize. Sugar and glucose are precursors to fat in the liver, but they're also critical for glycosylation. And I've been talking a lot about the glycobiome and how sugars must be added to proteins in order to make them functional. But the problem is we're eating foreign sugars. Plant uh -huh. sugars are not natural to our diet for the first three and a half million years or whatever that number was. We did not eat significant plants. And my bet is we evolved out of a plant eater to become a meat eater. And, and it was the eat, eating meat and not eating plants, which created the power of our brain. And uh -huh. when people learn about glycobiome, and the glycans and how the sugars from other microorganisms, remember the COVID virus, it's not the spike protein that's killing us. It's the spike glycoprotein. Mm. Most people have never heard of glycobiology. They do not know the importance of sugars in your body, but basically we would die without sugar. Yeah. But for different yeah. reasons. Isn't it, is it true that the backbone of fat can, is glucose? Um, so basically your body can create glucose even from fat. That's something that I've heard. Well, it makes glycerol. Okay. So, so glucose is just another glycan. There are nine or 10 glycans in the human body. Glucose, mannose, sialic acid, N-acetyl glucosamine, N-acetyl galactosamine, um, I, you know, it's a, they're, they're nine or 10 of them and glucose is just another glycan. And so your body makes glycans because when you eat meat, it contains amino acids. It contains simple sugars, monosaccharides, okay. and, it, and it contains lipids. So if you just think of every cell of your body, every cell of your body is made of these three molecules. And it's, it, it's, it's interesting that we in science know nothing about this. And, yeah, and if you ask, you ask someone, they'll say, well, well glucose is, is the, is the mitochondrial energy. Well, I will beg to differ because, because if you have no fat on your body, you will drop dead fast. Yeah. You cannot convert glucose to fat fast enough to make mm. acetyl-CoA. See, this idea that glucose makes pyruvate than acetyl-CoA happens, in my bet, only in the liver. And so, yes, you can make glucose, but we've made glucose somehow as like the master sugar. 
but but it's it's not it's just the one that we've honed in on and we've managed to to measure uh, for whatever reason but if i feed you sugar you become addicted to it don't you yeah and so as long as you're addicted to sugar i can manipulate you to do anything i want you become a slave a soldier a peasant and a prisoner you become a serf and so yeah. There's a reason we're all fed a plant-based diet, and there's still a reason why they recommend they, the experts, recommend a plant-based diet because you become addicted to it. Amen. You will line up for coffee, tea, alcohol. These are all plant-based products. Mm -hmm. And you will line up for pizza, pasta, and pastry, and you will get hangry, and you will blame it on your sugar level. Well, it's not your sugar level. It's kind of like addicted to cocaine or tobacco, yeah. right? Well, my, my, my cocaine level is low. Well, it's because the microbes and the plants know how to get you to do something. They sure do. It's really intense. I've worked with a lot of people who start dreaming about cake. And I think even my husband was dreaming about cake when he stopped eating sweets and he tried keto and he went back to pizza and it was just a slippery slope and he couldn't really change anything until he went carnivore. Um, but it was a struggle and he was a good example of real sugar addiction. I mean, I know I was addicted to sugar, but he had like severe food addiction. He was so inflamed eating takeout, multiple takeout junk food every day. And he was like, I can't live like this. And he was in shackles, so much bondage. And now he's a carnivore and he's ripped and zero inflammation, great sex drive, can confirm. And it's just so awesome to see even his mood, you know, and I can speak to mood as well. Like we talk about being slaves by sugar addiction. And I think a lot of people hear that and they think of the physical addiction, but there are so many people with severe mood disorders, even bipolar, depression, and it's just run by sugar. You're blood sugar is going up and down and there's so much inflammation. It's incredible what happens when you just get a stable blood sugar um, and you get your brain, those amino acids and the fats that it needs. Um, do you notice like a, a huge significance with people that you work with in their mood, not just their fertility or mental or uh, physical health? Yeah. Everyone, everyone, everyone will, 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 you know, go through the same checklist that uh, I feel better. My mood's better. My sex drive is better my 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 body works better because because we're not damaged by the glycans of the glycobiome uh from foreign plant antigens which are sugars and yeah. and that's really the simple answer you know it's it everyone wants a complicated answer but yes you know if you can't find food we figured out to eat plants um that got us through but it it sure. but but we also just developed this idea that likely killing animals was hard, but likely we got too good at it and we were at risk of, of, of starving. So we began to figure out how to manipulate the plants. I mean, we want to go to Mars and beyond. Like, I don't know why anyone would want to do that, but I guess Mars going to Mars is equating to eating plants. You know, yeah. we yeah. only do it because we can, that does yeah. not mean it's good well, for us. Right. Well said, very well said. Um, how did you get into fertility? How did you just like hone in on that as a specialty? Well, well, let's see. I went to medical school thinking I wanted to be a family doctor. I broke my leg at age 19 in a go-kart accident, uh, in a go-kart without brakes. So that was idiotic of me to get on one without brakes, but you know, things happen for a reason in life and you take the cue. It's like, you know, you, you get mad at first and then you're like, Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's something here. So I was inspired by a hippie doctor at age 19. I looked at what it took to be a doctor and I said, this is too hard, but didn't matter. I was doing it. I became a doctor. Uh, I went to UC uh, Davis Medical School and it's a family practice oriented uh, direction. That's kind of what I was interested in. But um, my first rotation in my third year of clinical was uh, OBGYN. And mm. They were the happiest doctors. They loved what they did. They delivered babies. Uh, and a lot of the surgical correction, the things we did were, we weren't curing cancer or, you know, we weren't treating those diseases. We were treating things like fibroids and endometriosis and fertility related things, which was yeah. 
pretty related to not that hard to do. Okay. And I was a surgeon. I love surgery. Uh, but uh, in my first year of practice at Roseville, California, Kaiser, I worked with Kurt Kluster and he was doing a lot of fertility and he needed a helper. And so I was the new young guy on the, on the, on the beat and I became the helper. And I learned about ovulation induction and insemination and, and ovulation and, you know, really love that. And literally I get a call one day from someone that says, Hey, do you want to do a fellowship in fertility? Wow. I, I didn't call anyone. I didn't, I didn't do anything other than the universe was responding to my desire of what I love to do. And okay. so I went off to LA where my hometown and did a year, two years of a fellowship. And uh, from there, I went to practice in Berkeley, California for two years, but I didn't love it. I wasn't loving just doing that. And I didn't love the, the place or who I was working with. Now, amazingly, again, the universe has ways of making changes in your life, right? You're, you don't like something, you're disappointed in something because you're looking at it the wrong way, right? Now I look back at it today and I'm like, you sneaky little, you know what, that God <laughs> had a mission for me. So God sent me on a quest to look around the country for a place to live. And I found skinny Atlas upstate New York. I moved here with my young daughter and wife at the time we raised our daughter and I started seeing my fertility At the time I was delivering babies. I was doing full gynecology and fertility. And over time I found my, my, my really sweet spot of life, which is the learning and understanding about the trials and tribulations of being infertile. And it is my, my passion, my day job, my hobby. I mean, I, there's nothing about work that I despise at all. Um, I have about 450 employees. I own and run CNY fertility centers, one of the uh, largest fertility centers in America, but we integrate Eastern and Western medicine. We talk about God and faith and food. And um, we have managed to keep our costs uh, lower and affordable for people that can't afford the standard fertility care. And so, sure. you know, how did I get here? Is God's God's guide. That's amazing. Wow. I got goosebumps listening to that story. That's Thank so you. cool. Thank you. Well, again, it's, it's, it's a heartache, this business. And, yeah. and, you know, it's, it's a, 70% sadness and 30% joy because in any one month of treatment, 30% people get pregnant and have a baby and 70% either don't get pregnant, don't have a baby or miscarry or something. And the more I, I, I love the integration of Eastern and Western medicine for me, you know, I talk more about faith and food, which will give you the fitness to helping you conceive naturally yeah. versus assisted reproduction. And I have so many people that, that have done IVF and failed and failed and failed, yeah. did keto, some worked, some didn't, did carnivore, more worked. And, and you know, it's and none of these things are like, oh, it's going to happen. It's yeah. just, you know, be open to what God's gifts of life are. It's either going to happen naturally or with some assistance. It's all with assistance, by the way. It's God's assistance. But Amen. whether it's adoption or donor eggs, donor sperm, donor embryos, or find joy and happiness exactly as you are. That is really, really the master class, I think, is, is be joyful in the trials and tribulations. I've got troubles. I got home troubles, work troubles. I got, I even have, I, like, let's see, uh, between, what did I have? Uh, I, I had shoulder, I had shoulder, uh, uh, what I had, I had uh, um, a uh, tendonitis, calcific oh. tendonitis, and uh, it's fine now. But, you know, we're a moving, living entity carnivore is not here to cause you to live 150,000 years right? <laughs> right you're gonna die and you're right. gonna be taken down just like everyone else it's gonna be something heart disease cancer diabetes depression whatever it is right but i'm betting a billion dollars that you'll live happy more happily and you might live longer might but longer isn't the key here it's True. just, just, you know, as a, as a doc, I'm, I'm learning a lot about the human body and oxidation is going to happen to your body. It's going to wear down yeah, and you can't stop it, but you can find more joy in even the hardship every day. Amen. 
I, so I'm going to put myself out there. I recently had a miscarriage, which you're aware of, and I really battled myself with why, why did this happen? Um, I got my labs de- like a lot of labs reconfirmed. I had, I have zero nutrient deficiencies. My hormones look great. Um, and so, you know, the doctor told me there's nothing that you did wrong. It's probably just has to do with, I don't know, the, the, lack of DNA or something like that. And, um, so I, I'm curious if you would have anything to say to me for someone who's, I have a regular cycle. Do you think that it could be coming from my husband who eats seed oils on a semi-regular basis? Um, or how frequent are miscarriages? Um, how frequent is it the case where it just really was something that wasn't going to work out well? And so the body did away with it. You're not 13, 14, or 15, are you? No, I'm 30. Right. So our best eggs are when we're 13, 14, and 15. Wow. Okay. So reproduction drops from there. I mean, why do we develop secondary sexual characteristics at age 13 to, you know, 11, 12, or 13? Is because, because there's nothing in life except reproduction. That's all that matters, right? And so it takes egg and sperm. So your body had been exposed to the environment for however many years before you were carnivore. But that doesn't mean that there weren't other things in the environment that didn't damage your eggs. So the eggs that you were born with have been exposed since when you were in your mother's uterus. Wow. So in essence, the damage could be done at the time you are conceived essentially. Right. Yeah. And it all depends on what your mom eats, what she breathes, what she drinks that and the environment she lives in that affects your eggs to this day. Right. So whatever egg manages to be ovulated could be have some DNA damage. Remember, it's all happening at a microscopic level. DNA damage, DNA fragmentation, glycation all happen. And some of it never heals. Now the sperm source similar, but new sperm is always being produced. So Mm -hmm. if your husband isn't a strict carnivore and hasn't been that way for at least three to six months, then there still could be bad sperm, damaged DNA, sperm, damaged DNA, eggs, damaged DNA embryos, which is all secondary to exposure to foreign glycans, which are mostly plant sugars and plant oils, right? Okay. And plant yeah. proteins. Lectins, lectins are 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 glycan binding proteins that mostly come from plants. And there's something called a a phytohemagglutinins, which come from wow. plants, which bind to our cells, our glycoproteins or lipoglycoproteins, and do damage at every level, our body, how long have Mm -hmm. you been carnivore? Four years myself. Right. So, so you're, again, you've been, your ovaries have been filtering the blood, right? Which, which is essentially a little bit of a filter of your GI tract. If you think Mm -hmm. about it, what we breathe, drink and eat gets through our, 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 our epithelial layers that gets into our bloodstream that first goes to the liver. The liver may filter some things, but much of it gets beyond the liver where Mm -hmm. then is filtered in every other organ of your body. So again, you know, um, your odds are still excellent and whether or not you were exposed to something in the air, it's just like COVID, right? COVID virus. Uh, it tends to affect more people negatively if you're glycated. Oh yeah, for sure. So gly- glycation is the leading cause of disease. And I believe our evolution as humans is because we were eating, we were eating animal glycans and not plant glycans of any significance. But if you look back at many of our diseases, they were related to microbes Today now they're mostly related to to the 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 nutrition, the diet we're eating more so than dying of viruses, bacteria, and yeast. Although what we saw with COVID 
just like like we see with many other large um, uh, 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 infestations of these bacteria, yeast, and viruses that kill millions of people, like the flu epidemic, uh, we have to be very careful. So basically, yes to the sperm issue, still the egg issue, which ultimately can create a damaged embryo issue. Um, and, and it's also possible that your uterine environment was damaged and still has some healing to do that could be a yeah. factor in all of this. But quite often, everyone blames, they, they blames the, the, the DNA or the chromosomes. Yeah, that's what I heard, the chromosomes. But don't blame the chromosomes because the chromosomes, the chromosomes weren't the cause Right. They were they were the secondary damage, just like cancer. Right. See, cancer mutations don't cause cancer. They're the secondary damage that happened from a plant-based, low animal fat environment more than anything. Yes, thank you for that. That is the best explanation I've received thus far. I didn't have peace about hearing, you know, it was a chromosomal defect or something like that. It's like, well, what caused that? That doesn't tell me anything, but that makes sense. I didn't have a cycle for 16 years. And so I hope to break the trend. I hope that when we do have children, I believe we will, my children will be healthy and very fertile because of the choices I'm making. Hopefully I can, you know, make a big impact in that for my choices moving forward. As for my husband, I'll have to let him know he's going to have to go strict for at least six months while we're trying to have kids. <laughs> it, will, it, will, but it will help tremendously. But, but again, you know, I mean, lots of people have babies that aren't on carnivore and we know that. I know. Yeah. And, but, but there are more miscarriages today. There are sudden infant death syndromes are on the rise and women are dying at a higher rate than ever before. Wow. Um, so that are pregnant and so, and post-pregnancy. So these are things that I believe the nutrition is critical. I mean, everyone's eating smoothies and shakes and they're having all these, 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 um, these health drinks, right? Uh, healthy drinks that I'm like, why aren't you just making bacon and eggs every morning and steak and eggs at night and, you know, keeping it simple. And they say, well, I don't want to be bored. I'm saying, well, are you bored with your husband or your wife? And, wow. and we're, yeah. we're, we're using the wrong terminology here. Uh, yeah. But yeah, you're right. It is, you know, going through, going through infertility or miscarriage or, or pregnancy losses are huge emotional challenges and drains on individuals and a relationship. Yeah. And we're not given the tools to go through that. Yeah, and I, I agree. I, I felt think very what, lost. Yeah. Who do you talk to? Right. Yeah. I also was told multiple different things by the doctors. One doctor said you can do it naturally at home. And then I spoke with a doctor over the phone and she practically said I was insane and I needed to go to the emergency room and take the abortion pill. And, and I just didn't, I ended up talking with Nisha Barry to be like, is this okay? And I, I went through it at home. Um, and I made a video on it. And honestly, just being able to share with the public and talk with people like you has been what's gotten me through it, Jesus Christ. And my husband has been very supportive. Thankfully, our relationship, I think, is stronger because of it. Um, and we believe it's God's will. So I know it'll happen. But I definitely think that there is not enough information, not even a little bit that would make me have any type of peace about this. Like no one talked to me about miscarriage. I didn't know how common they were until after I had it. And I had hundreds of women reach out saying they had multiple miscarriages. And so I'm glad to hear that you're, you're spreading the truth and you're also talking about solutions. I really wish I would have had that, but I have that now. So thank you. And you're sharing it. And that's really important. I think the beauty of social media is social medicine is being able to share the stories because yeah. we're just simple stories and we're sitting around the campfire. We're sharing stories. Our grandmother's 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 stories are critical and women share stories and men fight. And, <laughs> but the stories are critical for women and men also that yeah. we share the stories and how hard it is because men suffer also through miscarriages and loss and things like that. Uh, we just do it in different ways, but I think you're, you're right. You know, we do a lot of, uh, I don't, I don't use the abortion pill. I always say natural or a DNC if you want, but you know, yeah. you got to find out what each person wants individually. What makes right. you feel confident and comfortable with this? 
miscarriages are likely natural to human reproduction, no matter where you're at in the millions of years of evolution. Uh, most animal reproduction, only a small percentage of those that are created actually survive to adulthood and reproduce. Wow. I had no idea. I thought yeah. you were going to say the opposite. No, wow. no. You know, again, look, at you know, many animals spread their seeds, but only very few make it to, to uh, adulthood. If you look yeah. at, you look at eagles, if you look at, um, uh, 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 bears and cheetahs and things like that, sometimes only one, the strong survives of mm. those twins and triplets. And so this is nature's way. And so yeah. maybe in the same way for us, but we're not living in a very natural environment. We're right. living in a, a very uh, man-made environment. And we are the, we are the crux and the culprit of all the disease in the world. And ultimately that's our problem. Yeah. yeah. Earlier, you mentioned talking about, or you mentioned that you eat one meal a day. When did you start doing OMAD and what is it that is so attractive about it for you? Well, I can't remember exactly when I started that. I think for years, I typically didn't eat breakfast. And then I started eating granola and, 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 uh, and yogurt every morning. Yeah, and uh, as a kid, I used to drink um, eggnogs in the morning. And, wow. uh, I did that for a long time <laughs> and, you know, I was, I was a three meal a day in some way for years, but as I began to learn more and more and more about nutrition and the way that our bowels work and our bodies work, fasting in one meal a day was all the calories I needed. Yeah. Number one. And just, let's say a calorie is a calorie, but ultimately we have no idea what a calorie is. That's our biggest trouble, Right. We say a calorie, but none of us have any idea what a calorie is. And so, um, so if if I'm trying to lose weight, why would I eat three meals a day? And I'm going to eat one meal a day. Now, I typically am not trying to lose weight, but I'm happy with my weight. Although sometimes five pounds around the center, you know, could be. But I'm happy with it. Um, it but an empty gut brings a full life, mm -hmm. and fasting. See. When you eat food, it typically takes days to digest. So if you think about your bowels are full of digesting food for days, actually the nutritional recommendations are three to five or six meals a day, pretty much since the day you're born to the day you die. So your bowels are always full of food, correct? Yeah. So as long as your bowels are full of food, there's always food being secreted into the liver or into the lymphatics. Now, what is the standard diet that everyone is recommended to eat? I mean, high carb, lower fat, moderate protein. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. So, so my plate, my plate is fruits, grain, and vegetables, which all break down to what? Sugar. Okay. So three quarters of your meal is sugar. Proteins, proteins break down to what? Um, amino acids. And where do amino acids go for digestion? The liver. The liver. What happens to them in the liver? Gluconeogenesis. They're converted to fat. Not gluconeogenesis. They're converted Only by to the fat. Stamps. Okay. Because if you, why are we making more glucose? They're already, again, it's, they are, they are, you're right in one point. I, I misspoke. They, they're ketogenic and glucogenic amino acids, but right. where do they go? You're converted to sugar, but all sugars in the liver are converted to what? Fat. Interesting. So the, that's hard so, for me to wrap my head around. Okay, that so, protein turns to fat. Well, well, when you eat protein, are you building muscle by not doing nothing? Does your muscle build or does your fat stores build? It's hard to say because fat, when I fat. was, can someone gain muscle without working out and eating protein? Have you ever had a ribeye steak that's well marbled? Yeah. So if you took away all the fat within that marbled piece of steak, is the steak lighter and skinnier? Yeah, definitely. Okay. So, so everyone's got to get it in their brain. And this is a hard one because we've been brainwashed. Glucose is not the energy for the mitochondria. Right. 
fat is. Right. Okay. Okay. So that's number one, kiltz's kiltism. And and many other people do begin to understand this, but it's a hard one. Okay, so now what's the function of the liver? Uh, detoxification. Detoxify what? Toxins. Which toxins? Name a disease um, that your liver is not detoxifying. You can't. I mean, yeah. Can't. Everyone says Tylenol and alcohol. Well, those are modern, modern inventions. They're not ancient nutrition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So why does amino acids and sugars go to the liver, but fats go to the lymphatics? Because amino acids are also a toxin. No, they're not. Amino acids are the building blocks for fat. Sugars are the building blocks of fat. What is your cell made of? Fat. Fat. And amino acids and simple sugars. But the backbone of every cell, every cell membrane is fat. Yeah. Okay. In this diet, is there fat in this diet? No. I mean, maybe in the dairy. Okay. What dairy do they recommend? Probably non fat. Crap. Non-fat, yeah, non non-fat, 2% exactly. milk. There is no fat in this diet. Okay. So our recommended diet is no fat, but your body wants fat. How does your body make fat? The liver converts it via insulin. It converts amino acids and simple sugars to fat. And that took me a while to figure that out because if glucose is not the energy that's for the cell, what is the function of glucose? Well, the function of glucose is simple. It's for the glycobiome. Okay. Okay. So now you see, you see the, the, the phospholipid layer, right? Those are the fats. Then you see the amino acid proteins, and then you see the sugars. These are the sugars here. Okay. So the sugars, see, people don't know anything about the sugars. Everyone says proteins are critical, right? High protein diet is a deadly diet. So remember proteins and sugars must go to the liver and be converted to fat or you die. You're not suddenly building a bunch of muscle because you ate a lot of protein. And have you ever heard of rabbit starvation and plant po yeah. uh, protein poisoning? Yeah, definitely. Okay? So all of our diseases are secondary to the fact that amino acids and sugars ferment in our bowels. So probiotics are deadly. Bacteria, yeast, and viruses in our bowels are pathologic in any significance or frequency. And they ferment. Fermentation makes alcohol, aldehydes, heat, gas, methane. Do those sound like good things for our bowels? No, sounds horrible. The GI tract, especially the colon, sits right next to what organs? Uh, I'm not, I really don't know. Reproductive Test organs. Okay. Prostate, Oof. testicles, Dangerous. uterus, tubes, and ovaries. So is there a wonder why everyone's suffering? It's simple. Uh, when you eat fat, where does fat go? Lymphatic system. Why? Because it's being oxidized for fuel. Because it's already the fuel your body needs and wants, right. and it doesn't need to be metabolized to fat. It's so readily the lymph, available. The lymphatics go directly to the heart, which distributes fat where? Everywhere. To the body. Yeah. Everywhere. And so have you ever noticed that butter never molds? Yes. Yeah. Why? Because it's a preservative. It's fat. Well, because it's, it's antimicrobial. Okay. And so when you eat butter, it suppresses the microbes in the mouth, in the esophagus, in the bowels. How many people do you know that you eat butter? Uh, quite a few in this space. In this space, right on. But so, in the real world, none. <laughs> so, so there's a, there's a, and I don't know if you could see this. I'll, I'll try this. Yes, so, I can see it pretty well. So, so the, the, let me see if I've got this, the right side here. Okay. So here's the normal side here. Okay. So the mucopolysaccharide layer is protected. And the microbes cannot get into the epithelial cells. But okay. once this mucopolysaccharide layer, which is the glycocalyx, which is the sugar protective layer that prevents 
the microbes from getting into you because now it's simple. The epithelium is broken down and the microbes are able to get into your bloodstream, your interstitial spaces and cause all the damage and disease. Think about the forests that are, that are decimated around the world. What happens to the soil? I mean, it's depleted of nutrients and it's eroded and it's eroded, right? You're right. Mm -hmm. So, so we are eroding our bowels by number one, if you eat three meals a day, you're always full of sugar, sugar and protein in any significance or frequency is damaging the very sensitive glycocalyx of the bowels. The sugars and the proteins get into your, in your bloodstream. They damaged the vascular glycobiome, the glycocalyx, which causes platelet aggregation, blood clots, and cause plaque, which ultimately damages the vessels, which are damaging the, the, the um, delivery of nutrients, including oxygen to your cells. The microvascular damage that happens is all secondary to glycation. And I use these words because most of us have not heard of glycation. But sugar right. is the leading cause of disease. And the reason my sister died of diabetes, because what's a recommended diabetic diet? High carb. It's that what you showed it's, us. It's 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 back to it's yeah. back to this, right? right? That's the recommended diet from a diabetic doctor. Unfortunately, my sister died of diabetes. I don't blame the doctors because I too, as a doctor, was taught this way. So back to why is fasting in one meal a day, because you want to minimize the food in your bowels. You want to eat, eat, eat fatty meat. It's quickly digested. It's sent to the lymphatics and the liver. The majority of the protein amino acids are being converted to fat because your body wants fat first. Muscle, muscle depletion and bone depletion is common in a plant-based world, but not common in an animal-based world. Right. Because the plants are working to kill each of us. And so if you want a three to five day fast or longer, then you're going to begin to heal the damage back to the damage, right? The damage here. Now you're, you're minimizing all the damage. You're allowing the, the, the glycobiome to replenish itself. Mm. Because the microbes in our body are not good for us of any significance or frequency. We've been duped once again to buy a product that our body does not require. Right. I would love to use this as a segue. We have a couple minutes left, but I would love to talk about probiotics. I get a questions all the time, you know, do you recommend probiotics? And my answer is no. I think that your microbiome is dictated by what you eat. And when I was suffering from a really severe C. diff infection, um, I took, of course, the probiotics, I took the antibiotics, I had three fecal transplants, and it was still seeded in my gut. Nothing changed until I addressed nutrition and removed the anti-nutrients and ate a bunch of fatty meat, truly. Well, um, and I remember some infectious disease doctors actually confirmed that an all meat diet is perfectly safe. And they told me probiotics are a scam. You don't need those. So can you share, I mean, are we missing out on beneficial bacteria and microbiome by not eating plants or are we actually being benefited? What's a benef beneficial microbe? Prove it. That's a good question. <laughs> Prove it. Would you put E. coli uh, in your uterus? No way. Would you, would you put any of these microbes in an open wound? No. So remember the science is built on the hypothesis that vegetables are good for us. Sure. Okay. So now if I'm sick, I'm going to measure the microbes and I'm going to say, wow, these microbes are really bad right now. They're all the bad microbes and it, they must be the reason you're sick mm. or they're partially the reason but you're feeding them, but your body is able to kind of, you know, most of the time, even as a vegan, vegetarian or Mediterranean, like I wouldn't say every moment of every day I was suffering, but because in some way my bowels were able to minimize the pain and discomfort. Right. 
So, so the, the immune system does a reasonably good job, but, but microbes are another science to sell snake oil, in my opinion, because you wouldn't recommend it in your, in an open wound or in your eye, or would you recommend let's inject these microbes in your blood vessels? No way. You wouldn't. So, so why are they good in your bowels? Well, because because someone's convinced you that you're an, you're a you're an um a ruminant animal right mm, that, that as a as a, it's interesting i was i was i love nature shows i was watching a nature show on panda bears panda bears have a carnivore's gi tract oh really yes what do they eat 16 hours a day bamboo bamboo are they very sedentary animals yeah so the reason they are is because they're eating the food that actually requires a tremendous amount of digestion and nutritional uh, uh, value from eating bamboo is not good. Now, that's how they evolved, right? Right. You know, we're not looking at them saying, well, they should be a lion or a, a real bear, right? But ultimately, we are having the same problem if you think about it, right? Yeah. A lot of plants feed the microbes. Well, the microbes in a ruminant animal are critical to break them down in the ruminant stomach so that the simple sugars can be, can be sent to the liver and in the liver, they're, they're turned into fat. You mm. see, everyone says, well, they make butyric acid. They make right. their fat, your fatty acids. I'm sorry. There is no significant amount of fatty acids from those bacteria and yeast that are helpful, in my opinion. Right. We've all been brainwashed. Propaganda and the propaganda of the industries that are making money on the science that they think is correct. Remember, if the premise is a plant based diet is healthy for you. And now I'm going to develop the, the drugs or the probiotics or the other things you need, including the supplements. I'm going to convince you this is what you need, right? But, and we're highly, remember, if, if you'll do anything for heroin, cocaine, marijuana, nicotine, caffeine, or alcohol, I can get you to do anything as a slave, soldier, peasant, or prisoner in order to get the thing I know will keep you in line. Yeah. And, wow. and that's and that's really the simple story. But probiotics are deadly for us of any significance or frequency, in my opinion. But don't believe me. Do your own research. And yeah. you know, so think of think of if you if you look on rocks or on plants or in soil, how much lichen and bacteria, yeast, and viruses are everywhere. A lot. It's everywhere. Are, are they easy to kill? No, not really. They They're grow not. like crazy. They are. So once they're in your body, are they easy to get rid of? No, they're not. Right. No. And so people suffer for long amounts of time when, with all of this, the bacteria and viruses that set up shop. That's why the diseases are not easy to, to, to get rid of with, with uh, antimicrobials. Even yep. a carnivore isn't always enough. Sometimes you need right. the heavy drugs, by the way. Uh, or you need the dissections or the surgical corrections. Again, you got to be open to all things, but ultimately the, the, our, our bodies evolved on a meat, fatty meat, organ meat, nutrition, not on a plant-based glycans from plants. And we're feeding the microbes. And what was the last time you saw a ribeye steak recalled for contamination? I've never heard of it. Nope. How about salad or fruits and vegetables, right? All the time. All the time. And honey, where does honey come from? Bees. Where does bee get the honey? Uh, I don't know. Sugar? Plants. Plants. Honey is plant sugar. Right. It's does not everyone hardcore. know that? I don't think so because a lot of people are eating it. <laughs> well, they, like honey is plant sugar, right? The honeybee goes around to the different plants and collects the nectar, correct? Right. If I collect the sap from a maple tree, is that any different? No. If I extract sugar out of a beet or 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 sugar cane, is that any different? 
I love this analogy. I'm going to use that. <laughs> it's like, you know, we're, we're, we're duped by people. Again, don't believe Kiltsy either, by the way. Listen, be very cognizant, right? When someone says you can eat honey and fruit every day, they're addicted to sugar. Yeah. And they've been duped to tell you that it's good for you. Yeah. Well, it feels good, so it must be good, right? Yeah. It's dangerous. It's so dangerous. Even people in this community, um, I wish people would just say, hey, this is what I'm doing, but you should figure out for yourself what works for you. Listen, I, I believe, again, simple sugars in small amounts infrequently are okay. Yeah. Because you have a healthy glycobiome, your glycocalyx is strong and healthy. You're able to convert the sugars quickly to fat. Now, remember, the liver's job is to make fat. So, so a liver failure patient, how many of them have, have diabetes? I would say all of them. Almost all of them. The majority of them have it. Yeah. And, and, and as, as, as liver cells are glycated and the functionality of your liver goes down, you begin to spill more sugar into your bloodstream, your insulin. I mean, why is insulin elevated with a type two diabetic? Because they're overeating sugar. That's all that's the only reason had they not eaten sugar or protein. Guess what? See, everyone blames insulin. It's not insulin. There's no, no such thing as insulin resistance. I, I will give you this insulin resistance is liver damage, mm. but insulin is still not the problem, right? You consuming plants that are never required in the human diet. Yeah. You broke the mechanism. You're breaking the mechanism. Although again, how often did you and I find food 10,000 years ago, hundred thousand years ago, when we were looking for a cantaloupe or a watermelon, right. like what did a cantaloupe and watermelon and how long did it last? Not Didn't. long. Right. Yeah. And so our, our access to plants was limited until we learned how to, to agriculture, which ultimately is the single leading cause of all disease and the modern world's use of plants uh, instead of fatty meat is deadly is, for humanity. This is so good. I think that this information is, I mean, it's great for anyone who just wants to improve their health, but I'm thinking of people who struggle with binge eating or eating disorders because many of those people don't know how to properly fuel their bodies. They've been lied to, they've been brainwashed. And this information is, I mean, I learned a lot. I learned about protein. I didn't know that protein was turned into fat. I had no idea. Um, I think for anyone who wants to be empowered about eating right for their body should just listen to you. I really appreciate you. I'm excited to have you at this upcoming spring retreat. I can't wait for the conversations and the questions. I'm going to have my notebook in hand. I'll be sure to be present for that because it's invaluable information and that changes lives. And, and I love that you focus on living your life not eating food. You focus on the quality of your life, which is very much dictated by how often we eat and what we eat. And that's so important. It, it, it's amazing. I, I'm pretty much, I'm not a hundred percent off alcohol, but I rarely drink it. I never drink it at home. And once in a while I go out and I have a little bit of martini. I, I'm off coffee now for eight months, never felt better. Wow. And, and, you know, for me, uh, cookie cake or ice cream, I'm very good at minimizing. And, yeah. but some people can't. But we right. have been duped because you think, see, the majority of sugar is actually not sweet. Did you know that? I only know that because of our last conversation. The <laughs> you pointed the, that out to me. The majority of sugars are actually bitter. Yeah. And, and, right. and, and, and again, you know, again, from, from vegetables, they're not sweet, but it's still sugar. And they contain all those nasty chemicals that want to kill and control us. So, but yeah. Rebecca, I appreciate this. Uh, what's the date of the retreat, by the way? May 11 through 16. And I'm not sure which days you can join us, but you're welcome for the whole time. Um, and we're going to have fatty meat. I'll do whatever I can to keep you with us for as long as possible. Well, I'm, I'm working on, on being there and I always got to look give me one second. Give me one. Let me see how to do this. Hold on a second. Uh, February, March, April, May. So the, what is it? The 16th through the 11th through the 16th, 11th through the 6th, 16th of May. Wow. That's pretty good. I'm, I'm looking at the 12th, 13th, 14th, one or two days to be there awesome. uh, because I, you know, again, 
these events have changed my life. Yeah. And, and I think we're touching far more people than I do by making an appointment to see Dr. Kiltz in the office or online. It is yeah. really amazing. And the work you're doing inspires me even more to keep sharing the miracle of mastering a life that really leads like a lion. And, yeah. and, and we got, we're changing the language, right? The faith and positivity. And I'd like to see more people in our space stand back and listen and learn and go, huh, that's kind of interesting. I never thought of that. Yeah. Wait, well, that, that's weird. I never thought that, that, gee, glycans, what are glycans? What's glycobiology? Yeah. Wait a minute. Sugar is not the energy for your mitochondria. Your brain does not require sugar as energy, but it does for glycosylation. So mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave with that. And I look forward to seeing everyone at the retreat 11th through the 16th in May with Rebecca Farmer, Tailored Keto Health. Thank you so much for inviting me Thank you, Dr. Today. Phillips. Thank appreciate you. Have a you. wonderful day. I'll talk to you again. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. And anything I can do to help, I'm always here live Thank at five. You. Love you. Yes. Thank you. Love you too. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, Rebecca. Take care. You too.